This video is sponsored by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform for building a beautiful website, portfolio, or online store. Hey, hello everyone. Today I wanted to do an updated how to paint a portrait in gouache video using traditional gouache and my brand new brush set with Craft Hammo. I won't go into the drawing process in today's video because I really want to focus on painting and showing you guys my new brushes, which I am really excited about. They'll be available August 30th, you can find the link below. Okay, let's go over the materials you'll need, including an updated list of colors. Okay, so for the materials, first of course we need some paper. This one is cold pressed, but any watercolor paper will do or mixed media paper even. You're also gonna need some tape to tape down the edges of the paper. This is Scotch Delicate Surface Tape, but you can use masking tape or washi tape, whatever you have. And for the paints, we're gonna need a titanium white, a warm red and a cool red. I'm using cadmium free red and alizarin crimson. You can use cadmium red cadmium free red either will work this one's just a little bit safer you're also going to need a warm yellow and a cool yellow i'm using cadmium yellow and lemon yellow next for blue i like to use ultramarine i also like to have burnt umber in my palette and these two colors are what i use to create my darkest dark so ultramarine blue and burnt umber make a really lovely chromatic black and then you can shift it a little bit warmer with alizarin crimson I also like to have burnt sienna and deep violet in my palette. These together make a really nice shadow color in skin tones. So these are all of the colors that I would really recommend you have on your palette, but I do like to have a few extra fun, convenient colors, if you will. So I'm gonna show you those as well. I really like having a lilac on my palette. It's great for desaturating skin tones. You can also mix it with burnt sienna similar to how you would the violet, and you get sort of a more mid-tone shadow color. I also really like to have a Naples yellow. Not necessary, but it's definitely a convenient color to have when starting a light skin tone mix. So instead of mixing yellow with white and then red, a little bit of blue, I can start here, just add some red, a little bit of blue, and I'm good to go. I also really like this Brilliant Pink from Holbein. I don't use this one so much in color mixes, but I really like it as a fun accent color. Similarly to the pink, I really like this light blue from Turner. It's very much a periwinkle blue. It's basically ultramarine, titanium white, and violet. So in a way, it is also a convenient color in mixes, but it's also a fun accent color. The last fun but totally unnecessary color is this cobalt turquoise light. Once again, just a really fun little accent color that I will sometimes use at the end of a painting just to add little moments of interest. So those are all of the colors I'll be using on my palette. Think of these as our skin tone mixes or our skin tone base mixes. Think of these as our darkest dark mix and these as our darkest mid-tone mix or lightest shadow mix and these are just our fun friends that are joining the party <laughs> and for our brushes i will be demoing my brand new brush set with craft hammo they will be available and on sale on august 30th if you want to know more about each individual brush in the set and sort of what I use each brush for. You can watch the unboxing video. I'll have it linked in the cards and down below. But really, I just like having a selection of flat synthetic brushes of various sizes and a few round brushes. And lastly, for the actual palette, the surface for color mixing. You can use any old plastic or ceramic palette, a piece of old packaging or an old plate. These are stay wet palettes, so basically there is a sponge that you wet and it keeps your paints wet for longer. So these are really great for working with gouache or acrylic gouache. This is the Masterson stay wet palette. This is the one I've been testing out recently. It is not Masterson's, it's red grass. 
I believe they call it their extra large everlasting wet palette and I've been really liking it, but I will talk more about this in another video probably. <laughs> oh, and lastly, a container of water. Just imagine any old container of water. I do replace the water throughout the painting process to keep our colors from getting muddy. So today we'll be painting using this reference image. It's a photograph of Mark Twain. I love the lighting in this photo. We have areas of extreme shadow and areas of light. Mark Twain also has really interesting features, including this curly mass of hair and a bushy mustache. So I knew it would be super fun to paint. We're going to start with the largest brush in the set, the one inch flat brush. And with a little bit of watered down light blue, I'm giving myself some big bold strokes to set the mood for the painting. You can really have fun here. I love this brush because I designed it with longer bristles than your typical one inch flat brush. And because of that, it holds a beautiful amount of paint. I'm not starting with a wash over the whole page today as I sometimes do because I really want the painting to be very bright. Next, I'm going in with the number six round brush and some burnt sienna, and I'm sort of sketching with the paint, making some adjustments to my drawing and giving myself a roadmap for where the features are, including the eyes, nose, and mouth. Then with the same number six brush, I'm painting in the darkest darks, with a mixture that is almost 50-50 ultramarine blue and burnt umber with a little bit of alizarin crimson just to give us some warmth. Shadows in portraits are almost always very, very warm. Then with the second largest flat brush, the three quarters of an inch brush, I'm carving out the large shadow shapes using a mixture of burnt sienna and violet and then I will shift the color to be more blue with the ultramarine or more warm with the cadmium red. I wasn't able to fit in the mixing palette on screen today. I really, really want to invest in a second camera so that I can film the mixing palette during my videos, but I'm not quite there yet and that's okay. For now, I will do my best to explain the color mixes as we go. Carving out the shadows in the eye sockets and under the mustache using the three quarters of an inch flat brush is so much fun. Using this large of a brush sort of forces you to simplify the shapes you see in your reference, which can lead to a much more interesting portrait because our eyes tend to prefer obvious shapes over ambiguous ones. I'm going in with the half inch flat brush and placing some areas of extreme warmth so mostly cadmium red, cad yellow, and white. I like to place these first so that the portrait feels like it's glowing from within. We will be painting over much of this later, but it is nice to have some of it popping through. Then I pick back up the three quarters of an inch flat brush. I use this one a lot early on because it keeps me from focusing too much on little details. I want to capture the larger planes with this brush before I start subdividing these into smaller planes with the half inch flat brush and the three eighths of an inch flat brush. If I was painting on a slightly larger scale, then I would be using the one inch flat brush for this. All skin tone mixes really come down to red, yellow, blue, and often white, and shifting the ratios of these. The warm or coolness of the red and yellow also makes subtle changes in temperature and saturation. Even when we use violet in our mixes, in our shadow mixes, it's basically just a shortcut of red and blue, therefore we need to add yellow which in the case of the shadows, burnt sienna often acts as our yellow. One of the reasons I was so drawn to this reference is because the color bands of the face are pretty noticeable. You can see that the forehead leans more yellow, the nose, cheeks, and ears lean more red, and the chin and neck lean more blue or purple. I've talked about these color bands before, but emphasizing these, or at least keeping them in the back of your mind while painting, 
can really help you with your color mixes. They don't have to be drastic, but it can really make a portrait feel more alive. The late great John Singer Sargent used this trick a lot in his portraits. Before we go any further, I'd like to thank the sponsor of today's video, Squarespace. As a creator, having a professional looking website is absolutely crucial. With Squarespace, I was able to design and customize my site to perfectly reflect my art aesthetic. And the best part is, you don't need to have any coding knowledge. What I love most is how easy it is to customize your site. Squarespace offers a variety of professionally designed templates that you can then transform and make them entirely your own. I also want to talk about their Fluid Engine. It's their next generation website editor, and it makes editing and customizing your site a breeze. With its drag and drop technology, it couldn't be easier to make your website look stunning on both desktop and mobile. And for those of you wanting to sell products or services online, look no further, Squarespace's online store feature is a lifestyle saver. Whether you're offering physical goods, digital content, or services, they have all the tools you need to start selling online today. Squarespace has really been integral for me to create and maintain a professional online presence. I've been using it for well over a year now, and I can honestly say that I am still loving it. You can go to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash emilyhughes to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thank you so much, Squarespace and let's get back to the painting. When painting portraits in gouache, I would suggest working mostly from dark to light, thinking about it as building up these layers. Though because gouache has a quality where dark colors dry lighter and light colors dry darker, there are many times where you may have to go over an area to adjust the value, Usually somewhere around the middle of a painting, I will go back in and make sure my darkest darks are still dark enough, and as I go, I keep adjusting to make sure that my lightest lights are light enough. As we add more values to a painting, we are able to make these comparisons more easily, so a dark color we placed towards the beginning of the painting might not look as dark anymore next to the other values we've added. A good example of how I paint dark to light is in the mustache. You can see that I painted the big dark shapes first and then added mid-tone shapes and then you'll see I add smaller lighter shapes to indicate hair on top. It's also really important to let your strokes dry before fiddling with them. That way you can see what the color looks like when it dries. Then you can see if you need to go over it or if it's fine as it is. If you're trying to adjust values and hues too much while the paint is wet, you might end up with a muddier, duller looking painting. Instead, if you think about each stroke you place before you place it and then let them dry without messing with them, your painting will look a lot fresher in my opinion. You'll see that I don't use the 3 8 of an inch flat brush or the round brushes too much until closer to the end of the painting. In the middle of the painting session, I tend to stick to the 3 quarters of an inch or the half inch flat brushes. It's really important to use the right brush for the job. If you need to fill in a large shape or area, use a larger brush. If you need to define something or depict smaller plane shifts, switch to a slightly smaller brush. I think it's a good exercise to try to keep using the large brushes for as long as you can. That way you're focusing on the portrait as a whole rather than getting lost in one eye or detail and then having the piece feel a little disjointed. Once we've gotten all of the large and sort of medium sized planes down, we can start to use the 3 8 of an inch flat brush. This is our smallest flat brush in the set, 
It's a really great brush. I know it's a favorite size of many artists, including myself. At this point, you can start defining smaller shapes and planes on the face. Maybe we're squinting a little bit less at our reference and we're subdividing the larger planes we've placed previously. Maybe we did the cheek as one large stroke, and now we need to show the subtle plane shifts of that cheek in the space. I use this brush to suggest eyebrow and mustache hairs. It's super fun. You can get nice crisp lines and shapes with this brush. If you turn a flat brush while painting with one corner of the brush sort of as an axis on the paper, you can create really fun triangular or pie-shaped marks. If you want a clean line or edge of a shape, always use the bottom edge of the flat brush rather than the side. By using the bottom edge, you can get really crisp lines and hair-like strokes. The half-inch flat brush in this set is my best friend. When in doubt, I pick it up to simplify the portrait. When I feel like I've done maybe a little too much or added a little too much information with my smaller brushes. To paint the hair, we have to squint at our reference and try to think about it as shapes of different values and hues, rather than as a bunch of individual hairs. We place the darker shapes first, followed by the mid-tones and then the lights. This makes the hair feel real and full and three-dimensional. I also add some transitional colors along the hairline to soften it. In portraits, whenever we can see where the hair is actually growing out of the scalp, that's always going to be a softer edge. And you can do this in one of two ways. You can either blend it with a damp brush to get a soft edge or a soft transition, or you can do what I sometimes prefer to do and mix a color between the skin tone and the hair color and then place this where they meet. I sometimes find this way to be a little more interesting than just blending, but I recommend trying both out to see what you prefer. You can see in the reference that he is wearing glasses, and I believe they are the rimless kind, so it's difficult to see the glass lenses and make out where they start and end but we can see the shadows they create along the cheekbones and the highlights on the metal parts of the glasses. For the small metal highlights, I use the number two round brush. It's really great for getting very fine details like this. And for something like the lens shadows on the cheek, I actually like to use the edge of a flat brush rather than a round brush to create these lines. The color mix I'm using for the glasses shadow is burnt sienna and lavender, but I do make subtle shifts in hue by adding a little bit of cad red or lemon yellow, and this shows that the shadow is falling on a three-dimensional object rather than a flat surface. I finish the hair with the number four round brush, which is my absolute favorite for creating hair-like strokes and curls. This brush comes to a really nice point, so by slightly changing your pressure on the brush, you can get thicker or thinner strokes. I recommend not going overboard with this part. It can be fun to add in these hairs, but I promise you the painting will be a lot more interesting if you are more selective about which hairs you are going to emphasize in this way. I think I could have actually simplified the hair even more in this one, especially on the right side of the painting. I think it's a little bit busy, but that's okay because I'm learning for the next time. Always remember that each painting experience is a learning experience and that's a good thing, not a bad thing. Now we can add final details with our number two round brush. To me, this is kind of like icing the cake. It's a really fun part, adding in any last highlights. And this is also where I like to bring in pops of fun colors like pink or teal. 
It's totally not necessary, just something I like to do in my paintings. And now we can finally peel off the tape. If you use a blow dryer on the warm setting, it will soften the adhesive and make the tape come off super easily without ripping the paper. I sometimes find that after we peel off the tape, we can get a better idea of the composition. And sometimes this might mean that we want to fix or change a few things once the tape is off. For me, I wanted to go over the background and enhance the shapes a little bit. I really hope you enjoyed and maybe learned a thing or two. That would be great. My brush set with Craftamo is launching on August 30th at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The link will be down below if you're interested. You can also join me here for a painting live stream on the same day, starting at 1.45 p.m. EST. I'll be here painting to celebrate the launch. Thank you once again to Squarespace for supporting my channel, and of course a big thank you to my wonderful channel members and patrons over on Patreon. Thank you so much. Remember to like and subscribe and leave a comment down below, and I will see you all very very soon with another video. Bye bye